Um, but let's start. Uh, let, let's get us started in the beginning, Ryan. You know, how did you get into baseball? And uh, and does your Judaism intertwine with that? Or is that a separate story? So I started playing baseball when I was five years old. And my dad always played baseball. He was always doing pickup games on the weekends, playing high pitch softball. But the story of why I got started was my kindergarten teacher told my parents that I was not good at sharing and that I should get involved in a team sport. So they signed me up about as early as I could sign up when I was five years old. And I took to it really quick and the rest is history. You know, that's a good advice for my seven-year-old who was also not very good at sharing. So I, I, I appreciate that. And, uh, and what about the role of Judaism in your life? Was Judaism something that was important to you from an early age, or is that sort of became more important to you as you got older? No, it really wasn't. My mom is Jewish, and she always loved Christmas. Uh, they had like a white Christmas tree in her house with blue ornaments. Uh, and my dad would describe himself as a disenchanted Catholic. So growing up, we celebrated holidays from all, all religions, but there was no religion involved. We celebrated just to have a nice meal together, to have a reason to give presents and, and celebrate or light the candles. We, we went through the motions. Uh, I, sometimes I joke that we celebrated Hallmark holidays. And it wasn't until, really until high school that I, I started to, to grow into my own as an adult and start to search for more. And in high school, I ended up going to Temple for the first time with a high school teammate's mother who had MS and couldn't drive herself. So we kind of needed each other because I needed someone to go with and she needed someone to drive her. And that was really my first experience was, was as an adult when I started searching for more meaning behind, you know, why do we, why do we celebrate these holidays and what do they mean? And, and where, where's the community that I want to be a part of? So how did that, tra- where, and where did you go? What state did you go to high school in? I grew up in California, okay. LA, LA County in the Valley. My, my wife likes to make fun of me every time I talk about home. She, <laughs> she references that SNL skit, the Californians. Just like, oh, you oh, you were on the 101 and the 4-5. Um, so I, I grew up in Southern California. A lot of a lot of Jewish players on my youth league teams, on my little league teams. You know, I had bar mitzvah season for me. You know, when you're 13 to 15, the season of your life. I had a ton of friends that were Jewish. We had a great community here. Um, but my family, again, we, we were more of the Hallmark holidays. So when you were in high school, when sort of you started getting more into your Judaism, but also, you know, as you were playing, like, did you ever experience anti-Semitism on the field when you were when you were younger or even when you were older? When I was younger, not so much. And uh, I think the reason that I, I was able to kind of dodge those bullets was because my dad was Catholic and my mom was Jewish. So as we studied the Holocaust in school, I felt, you know, and to me, I'm almost embarrassed looking back, but this is my truth, is I would step away and I would say, well, I'm half Catholic. So the people that were hurt and the people that were, you know, killed in the and and anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism against like that wasn't me. But then I could also step on the other side and be like, well, I wasn't the evil villain either. It wasn't my people that were causing all this pain. And, and that helped me avoid feeling and and feeling hurt by the anti-Semitism as a kid. But what that also did was it it kept me from feeling the benefits of the community. And it wasn't until later, and, and we can get into this, of when I played for Team Israel and I fully embraced being Jewish and, and publicly, that I f- started facing anti-Semitism for the first time and really internalizing it and feeling it personally. But then that was also the first time with that came the feeling, the sense of community and feeling, feeling like I'm, I'm your brother and you're my, you're my brother, you're my sister. And like, we're all in this together. So I feel like they go hand in hand. So let, let's dive into that, the team Israel stuff a little bit. Your, your first experience with the team came about in 2017, 2016, 16. Yeah. 16. How did that all start? I mean, how do you, as a, you're a major league baseball player, you're a world series champion and you get a phone call from some guy who was like, hey, like we've got this team, we want to create it. Or is it your the World Baseball Classic is going to be a big thing and you want to be, find a way to be a part of it. And you're a great catcher, but you might not be picked for Team USA. Like, how does this all work? So my first, I, I yeah, I got a phone call from some guy that I never heard of, right? His name is Peter Kurz. 
Uh, I don't know. I don't know if it initially came through my agent or how he first got a hold of me, but I got a call in 2012, oh. and I had just made it into the big leagues as a rookie the year before. I had like half a year service time. I'm still trying to prove myself and establish myself as a major leaguer. And he said, "Hey, we have this team Israel, and we play baseball. Surprise! You never heard of us," which I think was everyone's reaction. Um, but you qualify for the team because your mom's Jewish. So what do you think? And I was like, well, what's, what's the WBC? Because 10 years ago, it wasn't very popular yet. So it was still growing. Um, he's like, well, we have to qualify to get into the tournament because we only have one field in our whole country and we're ranked 64th in the world, but we think we can do it. What do you think? The, the qualifiers in September, can you be there? And I was like, well, it sounds like an amazing opportunity. Let's do it. But if I get called up again this year, I'll be in the big league. So I can't be there. So September 2012 came and went. I was in the big leagues. I wasn't able to go, but I had the seed planted in my mind of this. Is, this is a possibility. This is a thing. So four years later, they just missed qualifying in 2012. They had a lead in the last inning. And my now best friend from this team, Josh Zide, ended up blowing the lead. Flash forward four years later, 2016, I get another call. Hey. We're going to try to qualify again. We just missed it last time. We think we're really going to make it this time. Can you be there? And this time my answer was, well, I'm probably going to be in the big leagues. But if for whatever reason I'm not, heck yeah, let's do it. And then the skies parted. I had It was the first year in, in six years I wasn't in the big leagues in September. Hmm. And I was available. And I went and played. And what I remember showing up when I first got there was Josh Zide spoke very passionately to the group about how blowing that lead four years earlier had, is still eating him up inside. And it was the, the lowest of lows for his career and everything he had done pitching in the big leagues. That was the moment he wanted to change. And he, his impassioned speech really spoke to the rest of us about, oh man, this is maybe more important than we thought. Hmm. So I want to jump back to something that you said, which I, I, I find very profound. You get a, this random person calls you and says, hey, your mother's Jewish. You, you qualify to be on the team. How do you respond to that? Right. You started up by saying that you sort of got more into your Judaism when you were in high school. And but like, how do you feel? What is that? Connect? And by the way, had, had you ever been to Israel before? Was there any sort of connection to Israel as all of this is sort of taking place? I had not ever been to Israel. Uh, when he first called me in 2012, my wife and I were engaged to be married. Uh, by the time 2016 came around, we had been married. My wife was raised Jewish. She had a bat mitzvah. She had been on birthright. We had a Jewish wedding. Uh, I, was, I was more involved in the Jewish community locally in Denver and had really embraced on a personal level that I, I'm a Jewish man and I want to raise a Jewish family. I want to be involved in the Jewish community in Denver. I still had yet to say that publicly because playing for the Boston Red Sox, our media training, at least 10 years ago, this was before athletes branding themselves and having their own brand was really acceptable, especially in baseball. Baseball was one of the last sports to embrace that. So the Boston Red Sox media training involved, if anything is even potentially controversial, just keep it to yourself. Like, the Red Sox is the brand. Don't tarnish it. And Boston itself as a city is a little closed-minded, I would say. It's not, I think people that know Boston could, could agree with this, that they're not the most forward-thinking um, city. So I just no kept it. to anybody from Boston who's No, I love, I love the city of Boston. <laughs> Trust me. I love, I love Boston. It's one of my favorite places. I still feel at home there. I've got my Red Sox World Series ring on the table right here. Um. But like I know some of my black teammates didn't feel comfortable you know, and black visiting players don't feel super comfortable there. So it's just it's just the way Boston is a little bit. So I just kept it to myself play, when I announced I was going to play for Team Israel was the first time that I, I really feel that it was, it was public. And I feel maybe in a way that's the first time I, I dove all the way into the deep end of embracing it hmm. uh, because you have to say it to the world. Right. If, if you if you are privately Jewish. Um, in a sense, you could say that maybe it's you're hiding it a little bit mm -hmm. or, or it's just you're just not announcing it. So I finally announced it to the world. 
I finally experienced anti-Semitism for the first time in a way that I really internalized and personalized. Uh, and I was really embraced by the Jewish community. And it was really wonderful in that way. Can you speak? Uh, so uh, sort of two things. One is AJC has a campaign that we created called Jewish and Proud. And it's something that we've been sort of pursuing as a result of the rise of anti-Semitism in our society. So I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that that's so important uh, to life. In fact, one of the reasons that I, I wear my, my kippahs and one of the reasons is that I've got a hair problem in the back, but the second reason uh, is that I, I feel it's an important identifier because I'm very proud to be Jewish and I want people to be able to, to know that. Um, but on, on one of the things that you just said was that you, it's when you started to experience anti-Semitism uh, really publicly. So could you share a little bit about that, what, what that was like or what type of experiences you might have had? Yeah, so it, there was a couple of experiences that were more subtle. And it was more of a people questioning like, oh, I didn't realize you were Jewish or like, I, di I didn't know that about you. And I felt like I felt like they felt permission to express their questioning or they they got felt like they had the right to have an opinion. Which hmm. ultimately. What's the difference? I'm the same exact person you've known for years. And now you think you have a differing opinion about me and just the, the fact that they even made a face or, or had a slight different tone when they talked to me. It made me, it made me feel like, well, why, why did something change? Why did anything have to change? Mm -hmm. There was, there was some more, there was more obvious experiences. Uh, baseball is a very Christian sport, at least on the professional level. You know, there's, I think that we have 12 Jewish major leaguers this year, and that's a record out of out of really? 700 and 780 players in the major leagues 12 are jewish so it's very much a minority uh so every every sunday they a chaplain comes in and holds baseball chapel in the dugout or in the clubhouse for both teams and they do it in english and in spanish so it's it's a really established institution within baseball and it's great for those players but it's not my thing and and i i kind of established that's not my thing was my was my go to response when I was invited because they tried to they would try to include everybody. And one time I remember I was in Gwinnett, Georgia, the AAA team for the Braves. Yeah. So it's up the street from where I live right now, where I am right now. Yeah. And I was, I was invited to baseball chapel. And I said, well, it's not my thing. And the, the chaplain really pushed back of like, why wouldn't you go? And I was like, well, I'm Jewish. So, you know, I don't need to go to, to baseball chapel. I got I, we have our own we have our own thing on the weekend. And. And he said, well, I've dealt with heathens like you before. And I don't remember what happened with the rest of the conversation, but it left me think it left me feeling really awful uh, that he would call me that. And I, I honestly didn't even know what heathen meant. So I, I went and I looked it up in the dictionary on my phone. Uh, and I, I think technically by by the definition, heathen just means non-believer. But the way he said it made me feel like he was talking down to me. Yeah. Um, like I was less than and it, it re for a for a supposed man of God, I didn't think that was very ethical or, or I didn't really like the way he handled it. So so small experiences like that. And then there was one other time I, I was in triple I don't remember what team I was with, but one of my teammates in the outfield was expressing some other backwards opinions about some other groups uh -huh. uh, that he thought maybe I might relate to, which I didn't. And he he also went on to add. Uh, also, if we're going to be friends, I'm going to have to tell you you're wrong at some point because you don't believe in Jesus Christ. And I was like, okay, guy, well, then we're just not going to be friends after yeah. this. Um, so there, there has been experience. Some of them uh, have been more subtle. Some of them have been more obvious. Um, but I, in my in my experiences, I, I feel like anti-Semitism falls into two major categories. It's either ignorance mm -hmm. or, or it comes from hate. And, and I approach them in two separate ways. I, I think if it stems from ignorance, I try to educate them. And I, I, it shouldn't have to be my job. And, and anybody that is a Jewish person, it shouldn't have to be your job either. But if we don't do it, who will? Mm -hmm. And I think, I think it goes the same way with, with anybody that is the receptor of any sort of ignorant hate, you know, whether it's Black people or, or, or gay people, anybody that, that experiences that, it's, it shouldn't have to be your job to educate people. But again, if you don't, who will? So, so when someone makes a, a joke that might be hurtful or someone comes from a place of, of not understanding why it might be hurtful, I try to, I try to educate them. Like this is where the history of that joke or the history of that 
um, ignorance comes from. And, and then in general, people, they don't want to be ignorant and they don't want to be hurtful. So most of the time they back off. Yeah. The other time is when it comes from hate. And I don't know if, if you can necessarily change people's hearts. Um, but depending on when I experience anti-Semitism or any or other form of hate that comes from a hateful place, I think there's two ways to deal with that also. Yeah. Um, and I take one of my cues from Hank Greenberg, who was you know one of the more famous baseball players in history. He was a big, strong, intimidating person. But he would he would stand up to it, and I and and he took the approach, uh, at least from from the stories that I've heard, of you deal with a bully, you stand up to them, and you and you maybe intimidate them back, and then they'll back down. And I think that's one way. Or the other way is if it stems from a place of of hate so much that you're in danger then that's when you, you know, you kind of try to avoid it or you, you reach out to authorities in some regards. So yeah. depending on where the anti-Semitism comes from and, and what kind of category it falls into, I, I deal with it in different ways. You know, Ryan, I, I appreciate you sharing that. Unfortunately for me, it's not surprising to hear what, what you shared. And I'm sure for many in our audience, they wouldn't have expected it. And yet it's also might not be a surprise. It's, it's also one of the reasons AJC created a, a tool. It's an online glossary called Translate Hate, for those experiences to be able to explain to people what the root of the anti-Semitism that they might be sharing comes from. Uh, and I, I absolutely agree with you about the two types of, of anti-Semitism that, that, that you've experienced. I, I'm curious if you ever, did you ever talk to the other 11 Jewish players uh, in, in the majors about their experiences or that you sort of just assume that they had similar ones? And, and I guess, uh, in, combining that with did you ever experience it from the fans no in, in general a lot of most of the fans have been really supportive mm -hmm. or or don't bring it up at all so uh f fan wise it's been really really positive yeah and as far as talking to other players about it when we're with team israel is when i interact with the other jewish players the most and we're really just enjoying the experience and really positive um so any any experience I speak of is really personal, and you'd have to kind of talk to them about theirs. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. So let's let's talk a little bit more about what it was like to represent Team Israel. Um, what what was it like? I mean, here you are you you sort of you've done a very cool things in the majors. You get to be a part of this team, this unique gathering of the diaspora Jews, essentially to represent the Jewish homeland. Here we are again, Yom Ha'atzmaut, Independence Day, talking about that. What what was the was it was the team received well by the other countries in the World Baseball Classic? These are other ball players that you know, or sort of were you sort of shunned aside uh, a little bit? Well, so so there's that's like a loaded question that I could take in like seven different directions. Uh, let me let me take it where where I think, and then and then kind of audit my answer and make sure that I answered your question okay. when I get to the end here. So so the first thing is when I first started to play for Team Israel, I can be totally honest about this. I signed up because it was a great baseball opportunity. Playing in the World Baseball Classic was, I had never played international baseball before. So it seemed like a cool thing to do. And it would add to my baseball resume. Representing a people, a culture, and a country didn't even enter my mind. It didn't know what it would mean to me. So I signed up for a baseball opportunity. We played in Brooklyn in the qualifier. And it started to hit me when I stepped on the field with Israel across my chest. And we stepped onto the line for the national anthems before the game. And we took off our hats and we put on kippah. Hmm. And it was the first time that, that a sports team had ever done that in my, or at least a baseball team had ever done that. And it was really interesting. And I looked into the stands and there was, Brooklyn's a home game for, for Israel, right? There's a bunch of Jews in, in Brooklyn. And there was a few yeshiva schools with kids with the talid and kippah. And hmm. it hit me that these kids have never had a team like this where they can relate to every player on the field. And the, what, everything that I know about representation and how the more things you can relate to in, in leaders or the more things you can relate to in role models, mm -hmm. the more meaningful and impactful it would be for you as a, as a young person. It really hit me that I wanted to be the person for them. I wanted to be their role model. And then it hit me again when we got to Israel, because after we qualified for the tournament, they brought us to Israel and they filmed the documentary about it. They did a great job. I don't get any, I don't get five cents if you download it on Amazon, but check it out because they did a great job. 
um, going to Israel really, really it hit home for me. And it, it changed very quickly from an awesome baseball opportunity to how meaningful this is to represent my community and globally and, and people in a culture. Um, and then we got to Israel and we had a practice on the only field in the country. And I, I have this sense of meaning that's growing and my heart is expanding another size, like, like the Grinch on Christmas when his heart grows two sizes. And after our practice, we have a press conference with, with the Israeli media and they let us have it. <laughs> they, they were initially not excited to have us represent them. They, huh. they pushed back really hard of who are you to represent us? We don't even play baseball. You guys are outsiders. Who do you think you are? And I, we were all like, oh my God, like what? we thought we would, we were going to be at this press conference and it was going to be a love fest where they were <laughs> so happy that we made it into the tournament. And that was very much not the case. So um, that gave us pause a little bit, but we also appreciated that they didn't just accept us because we were winners. They mm -hmm. wanted us to prove it, like prove that you mean it and prove that you're going to represent us well. Um, so we went to Tokyo or we went to, uh, so, sorry, Seoul, South Korea was the first round and we started to win and we were counted out before we started. I don't know if you remember the article that ESPN posted. They called us the Jamaican bobsled team of baseball, <laughs> has-beens, wannabes, never worse, uh, that perfectly fulfill the role of team that has no business being there and somehow found a way to win minus they haven't won yet. That was what the article said. And that was maybe the best thing that ever happened to us because we got a very, very solid collective chip on our shoulders. Uh -huh. And we had a lot of players that felt like maybe they had been overlooked in their careers or hadn't got the opportunity or hadn't performed to their potential. So we had a lot of players that already had a chip on their shoulder. And now as a group, we had one. So we went out there and we started to win and we beat Korea and we beat Taiwan and we beat the Netherlands and everybody's now freaking out. We're a Cinderella story. And the other teams were great. The other teams, you know, you qualified for Israel, whatever. We move on to Tokyo and as, as we advance to the second round, now the Israeli media is like, we're so happy you're representing us. Thank you for being respectful and uh, giving positive energy on the worldwide stage and for playing so great. And, and now we have this positive thing. So the Israel media finally embraced us as we continued to send the message that we wanted to grow the game within Israel, not just win and not just say, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, we're out of here. But we all had the intention to be around for a while. And then we beat Cuba and the Cuban media was pissed. And I think they were probably embarrassed that they lost. And that was the first time that another country's media had been like, well, you guys are all American. You guys are America, America's B team. Yeah. Uh, and that was the first time we really got pushback. But realistically, nobody on team Israel would have made America's B team. Yeah. or America's C team, or America's D team, or E team, or F team. Like, we, we were a collection of has-beens, never wers and wannabes that qualified for Israel. And then most of that team from 2017 signed up for the Olympics, and we established Israeli citizenship and went back to Israel second time. And every time that we've been to Israel, we make the commitment to grow the game. We go and we host clinics for the youth. Um, we, most of the prize money for the team has gone to building new fields or funding international tournament travel for, for the youth. And, it, uh, the participation in baseball in Israel has doubled since the first time I, I wore a Israeli uniform. Interesting. So there, uh, there's so much, you're right. That was said uh, lots of, I'm so grateful that you shared all of that. I, I have no idea if I answered your question. <laughs> I'm not even sure what my question was anymore. Yes. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's perfect answer. I'm curious, any Israeli born players on on the team? To either, yes. the, the first, and when you played in Japan, there were no Israeli born players. Right? There was, there was, yeah, there was, yeah. So there was three, there was three Alon Leishman, Shlomo Lipitz, and Tal Arel. Okay. And Tal, Tal and Shlomo both played on the Olympic team, and Tal and Shlomo both played on the 2023 team as well. Shlomo is a legend in Israeli baseball. He's, he's, He's like 45 at this point. Uh, he, he runs uh, the city winery. Uh, there's like six locations in the United States. Um, 
but he still goes out there and gets out. I mean, he throws sidearm. It's, it's not fast, but it maybe right. is slow enough to be effective. And, <laughs> and like one of the legends of Shlomo was uh, he was one of the best pitchers with, you know, with Israeli citizenship before any of us got involved. Mm -hmm. And they had an international tournament where he pitched like 200 pitches in the first game of a doubleheader. Wow. And then also pitched the, the complete game in the second game of a doubleheader. What? because he was their best option is his he, this guy's unbelievable and he's such a great team player and leader for us uh, every time he every time he's around so i'm so glad to to know him there was a few stories that i i saw in the media maybe it was on espn or it might have been one of the other networks about the sort of people booing the team when they walked when they were walking through uh, the olympic village or the world baseball I mean, Maybe not in Japan because it was right after COVID and the restrictions. Was that anything that you experienced? Was that it's something that we see a lot? Is this, you know sort of the negative reaction towards Israelis, Israeli athletes uh, when they're traveling abroad? But that was never something that you experienced, was it? As a group, I I did not see group booing. Uh, yeah. That's not something I experienced. There was some individual experiences uh, uh -huh. that were not experienced by me personally, but other athletes on our team. Mm -hmm. For instance, as we were lining up for the opening ceremonies, we were lined up alphabetically, but in according to the Japanese alphabet. So oh. Israel was right behind Yemen and right in front of Italy was behind us. They were chanting. They were awesome to be near. They were very cool. Um, but one of our American Israeli dual citizens doesn't understand the global political landscape, wanted to trade a pin, right? That's what athletes do at Olympic Village. You yeah. trade pins. He wanted to trade a, a pin with a Yemenese athlete who was also an American Yemenese dual citizen who both live in America. So they both didn't understand the landscape, right? And they're, the Olympics is supposed to be the place where we meet on common ground, yeah. sport overcomes everything, level playing field, love, 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 love. So they exchange a pin. Our guy's pumped because nobody else has a pin from Yemen. It turns into a competition right. very quick. What kind of pins can you get? Who'd you get it from? And the, this Yemenese athlete was like a, like a toddler dragged by his ear back to our congregation by the president of the Yemenese congregation, very sternly said, we don't want anything from Israel. Give him his pin back. And then our guy was like, oh, well, here's your pin back. We don't even want the pin back from you because you've touched it. So, so that happened. And there was, a, there was a few other instances where uh, individual Athletes didn't want to trade pins. Uh, yeah. But as a whole, I think it was really positive. Yeah. You know, you know, the security around Team Israel in our dorms and the the elevators not going all the way to the floor and having to go through facial scanners and IDF security measures was yeah. different than everyone else. But overall, my experience was very positive. Did the by being members of the Israeli team at the Olympics, did the Israeli Olympic Committee do anything to share about? the the massacre of the 72 olympics was that at all a part of sort of the was there i guess in general was there sort of learning teaching yeah. touring that that israel did the the that the institution there did to help you all sort of have a better understanding if you'd never been there before or sort of different challenges and things like that on the global scale yeah there absolutely was so we all had to go to israel a second time to establish our citizenship which i think was the right thing to do you know you can't just mail us a passport Right. overnight right so we went to israel again we went to all the fields we coached right. kids um we went to independence hall we did all the things uh, what we also did was we had to go to their athletic institute to be put through a battery of testing they wanted to make sure we were healthy and that oh. we weren't going to die on the field right and and i don't know if you remember um the old gatorade commercials where they had a tube hooked up to your okay. mouth and the EKG machine, all the wires coming off and you're running on a treadmill. We did that. And we're running on this treadmill. We're dripping sweat. We're panting. Our hearts are beating. And we're all like, do you understand baseball? Like, <laughs> we don't have to do this. Uh, but they, they put us through all the crazy testing. It was, it was really awesome. And while we were at the Institute, we got to meet some of the judo athletes some of the windsurfer athletes. And we went straight from there to the Israel Olympic experience, which is like a museum for Olympics 
in Israel. Mm-hmm. It's not a very big museum. Uh, but what what they what it did they was it a, gave they us. Got, they've got some gold medals. They have. Thir- I I believe, and don't quote me because I I'm not sure on the facts, but I believe they had 13 medals before Tokyo. before Tokyo and four yeah. gold. I want to say. That, yeah. I think that sounds um, right. It sounds right. Maybe ju- judo and, and windsurfing. I believe. Yep. I might be wrong. Um, but going through that Olympic experience, it really gave us context for understanding the history of Israeli athletics mm-hmm. and the the tragedy that happened in the 70s. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I mean, you never, I assumed, I imagined that that's what they would do, yeah. but uh, it's such a, it, it's such an, and it's such an important piece of our, uh, of our history uh, and of Jewish history that I'm, I'm glad to hear that you were able to experience that. Um, in is we've got a, I got one or two more questions before we go to audience questions. Um, I'm curious in Israel, what was it like for you the first time, the second time? Does it change? Did your opinions change when you became an Israeli citizen? I'm not going to ask for your political analysis of the current situation there. I don't think that'd be fair. Uh, but how how has that experience changed for you and your family? By the way, right? You're married yeah. and you've got you know family. Anybody join you in Israel? So the first time I went. My, my parents were nervous because if you watch the American news cycle, you would think that Israel feels like a dangerous place. And they were like, are you sure you want to go, especially right now? Uh, so I, I went into it a little, you know, a little nervous, not knowing what to expect. And you land on the ground. And I was like, I've never felt more safe in my life. This place is beautiful. It's amazing. We spent the, the first time I went, we spent four days in Tel Aviv first beautiful city right on the water we stayed in this beautiful beachfront hotel and then we went to jerusalem and going to jerusalem and this is going to be a pained metaphor so please forgive me but like it was like in the same way the first time that i stepped into the old yankee stadium or wrigley or fenway park you can just tell it's different you can just smell the significance in the air you just know like i am among history Mm -hmm. like so many important things have happened here and I, and I get to experience this in the modern world and it just feels like your heart beats different. The air smells different. So going to Jerusalem was that for me and especially getting, getting to the Western wall, I swear to God, I felt God for the first time. Hmm. And it was just this transformational experience. I think I cried. I think they caught it on video for the documentary, um, which is cool for me to, to live through and get to see again, because that was a really really meaningful moment in my life. Um, but going there for the first time, yeah, my, my, my wife came with me. This was before we had our daughter, years before we had our daughter, but it was really, really meaningful and transformational for me to go for the first time. Yeah. When I went back the second time, I got to experience it all again. It, you know, you don't have that, that transformational experience because you've already, you've already changed as a person and you're changed forever. So it was really cool to go back again. And then they handed me my passport and, and I have this goatee, so I, I kind of felt like Jason Bourne, where I have two passports now, like, which one am I going to use, except they both have the same name. Um, it's very, <laughs> very, very, very cool. Um, so I'm going to go for some rapid fire questions before we throw over to the audience. Um, so oh, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. I have one more. I have one more. I think it's a good answer. Uh, yeah. And I don't I don't like to express my political opinions. Um, but what I'd like to tell people is is you either voted in in America, if you're an American citizen, you either voted for our current president or you voted for the last president. You didn't vote for both. And either currently or four years ago, you were unhappy with the the decisions that the government was making. I don't think that made you feel less proud to be an American. And I would would encourage you to, to use the same opinion when you think of Israel. Whether you agree with what the current government is doing or not, does not have to color your opinion of whether you agree with the concept of Israel. Yeah. When I when I think of Israel, I, I believe in what Israel is about and it being a safe haven for yeah. the Jewish people worldwide, whether I agree with what the current government is doing or not. Yeah. And I think I think it's very easy to judge ourselves by our intentions and others by their actions. And that goes the same with the country that you personally identify with also. So I just wanted to throw that in there. No, Ryan, you know, I, I still appreciate you saying that uh, I was speaking to a a group of high school students recently, and I, I shared with them that, you know, we were talking about the current situation. And I, I said, you know, Israel welcomed in 
Ukrainians as citizens, not as refugees, right? If you read Israel's Declaration of Independence, it refers to the survivors of the Holocaust and those who were expelled from other lands. And so the ingathering of the, the safe haven for the Jewish people is, is, is so important for us to be able to continue to remember the role that Israel plays in our lives. We're, you know, we're fortunate to live in the United States today, but we see that people need Israel more and more depending on where they live. Not everybody is as fortunate. And, and we, and there are many people who have moved, you know, to Israel because of the anti-Semitism that they themselves might've experienced here. So I, I, I think it's a, a really powerful uh, statement for you to make. It's something that I, I hope I, I'm guessing that if you shared it here, you share it with all of your audiences. But if not, I, I hope that that's something you continue to share with your, uh, with your audiences. Um, all right. Well, there's no easy transition to my rapid fire, so I'm just, gonna, <laughs> I'm just gonna do it. Just rip um, off the bandaid. There you go. Uh, favorite Israeli snack. Shawarma. Oh, snack that you have a very different appetite than I do, my friend. I have a very uh, big appetite. <laughs> Uh, favorite city in Israel? Jerusalem. Uh, favorite baseball memory? Um, two answers. World Series win or my debut with Cincinnati. Okay. Uh, most challenging part of being a catcher? Uh, the, phys- <laughs> the Hitting in the ninth inning. <laughs> uh, favorite Jewish athlete? Ooh, uh, Sean Green. Oh, God. former former New York Met. He uh, was a he was a Dodger, and his baseball card said that he was 6'4", 225. and that's what my baseball card says, even though none of those numbers are correct. Because I wanted to be like Sean Green. So wait, so how tall are you then? I'm like six three and a quarter, and at a point I was closer to like two fifty, but I wanted to be like Sean Green, and I actually got to meet him one time, and I told him that story, and he said I wasn't six four two twenty five either. I was, he, that dude was definitely not 225. There's no, yeah. too skinny for that. Uh, okay, uh, let's turn it over to Claire for some uh, questions from the audience. Thank you, Joe. Our first question comes from Layla Heinberg in Seattle. How can baseball be a connector between kids in Israel and in the United States? Ooh, good question, Layla. Um, so, so baseball is, it's such a great opportunity and all sports really are such a great opportunity to, like I said, the Olympics is supposed to be to meet on a common ground and normalize something in in a context that we understand. I think that anytime we can, as far as meeting United States kids and and Israeli kids, anytime we can get them together for tournaments in one place or another, um, let them meet each other, let them, let them, let them play against each other and, and see that we're not that different. And I think there have, there have been games between even Israeli teams and Pakistani teams or, or countries that don't necessarily love each other. And it's the same idea where you play on, on the field and you see that we're not that different. Thank you. Our next question comes from Billy Green in Philadelphia. When you traveled to Israel, you had the opportunity to work with young Israelis at a couple of clinics. What was it like and what impact did it have on you? Man, the, the kids were awesome the kids were awesome and we our bus ended up getting delayed so I think there was a little bit of anticipation built up especially the first time we worked with the kids and they all had our baseball cards they all knew our names they had all followed us uh, in the big leagues it was so awesome to see and to see that they're pretty good players over there they they know what they're doing and they have their coaching staffs and I know that our our team did a zoom course with all of the Israeli coaches where we taught them like, what should you be coaching and how do you coach it the right way? So we're really committed to building, to building baseball in Israel, but it's, it was cool to see the, the field that they had. And then we've built one more field, we've broken ground on a third field, but we also got to meet at public parks where if you can't make it to the one field that there is, where are you playing baseball? And it was interesting to see and, and they must love it because some of those parks were not we're not well groomed or we're not uh, the best opportunity for a level playing surface. Um, but it was very cool to see their passion for the game. Our next question is if you could make a plea to some of the other Jewish major leaguers to play with team Israel, what would you say? Oh man, if we could get all of the Jewish major leaguers, we could be really good because we could fill out a lineup pretty, pretty well. I would say that realistically, when you play for USA, you're trying to win the tournament. And realistically, when you play for team Israel, 
you're not going to win. But it means more. It means more than a baseball tournament. It's 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 a catch catchphrase to say you're playing for a country, a people, and a culture. Um, but you're playing for history. You're playing you're playing for opportunity and and for reputation and for for the meaning of of what it means to be a Jewish baseball player and to be a role model for a generation of kids that don't have sports role models necessarily. Um, so it, it it means more to me. And for the Olympics, I was actually recruited to play for Team USA. And I chose to still play for Israel instead because it, it means more to me. Um, and we almost meddled. It would have been really cool to, to medal and, and to have that forever. But it, it, means, it means something different to play for Israel than to play for USA. Thank you. As a follow-up that came through on Zoom, how does it feel now to be that veteran and to really be an ambassador for playing for Team Israel, whether it's baseball or other sports? I feel like it's, it's an honor um, because when I look in the mirror, when I'm brushing my teeth or whatever, like I'm just a guy, I'm just the same person that was a little kid that wanted to accomplish some of the things I've accomplished. And, and I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to do it. Uh, and I feel a responsibility to make sure that I represent and, and am a role model for these kids in the right way, because there's so many of our role models or so many of the people we looked up to on TV when we were growing up have been canceled and have and have shown that they are human beings and they've shown the worst side of humanity so i want to make sure that i always represent the right side of humanity and and the take that opportunity and and don't take it for granted thank you our next question comes from david hernandez who says you recently announced your retirement what does a post baseball career look like do you have any plans uh, to coach with maybe with Team Israel? And now that you're so open about your Jewish identity, how do you plan to continue to spread important messages that you've spoken about today? Ooh, that's like five questions, David. Um, I announced my retirement. I am I'm doing some motivational speaking and some team dynamics coaching. Like yesterday, I was in Florida uh, working with a group of uh, people from an energy company about team dynamics. And it's been really fulfilling uh, to see people moved and inspired to, to do something that they weren't thinking about the day before. So I'm speaking, I'm doing some broadcasting with the Rockies, some pregame and postgame shows. Um, and hopefully I continue to inspire people in a positive way. As far as coaching, um, I threw my hat in the ring for the next round of WBC, but there's definitely been no confirmation or anything like that. So stay tuned. Um, you'll know when I know. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. Thank you. What advice would you have for young Jews who aspire to play professional baseball? Uh, my advice for young Jews would be the same as my advice for young anybody. Uh, play because you love the game and enjoy it along the way because 99.7% of people are not going to make it to the major leagues. That being said, just because the odds are against you doesn't mean you're not going to make it. Um, when, I, when I hear the, the, the stat 99.7%, what I hear is, so there's a chance. And, and one, of, one of the biggest messages that I say in, in my motivational speech, it stems from a story in college, or in, sorry, in high school. My, my high school coach was walking around asking people who was going to hit fourth for us on our team. And I knew it wouldn't be me because I wasn't the best player on my high school team. There was four, at least four or five people that were better than me. I didn't get to start on my varsity team until I was a senior in high school. But I was a 17-year-old smart aleck. So I said to coach, I said, coach, why not me? And he kind of looks at me, he kind of tilts his head to the side. He goes, why not you, Ryan? And I, I think the emphasis on the word why not really planted a seed in my head. And I, I started to understand that the only reason it wasn't going to be me was because of limitations I was putting on myself. So as, as a young Jewish athlete or, or young anyone athlete, why not you? Why wouldn't you be the 0.3% that makes it? And if you set a realistic expectation on yourself, that's going to be your ceiling. You're never going to pass that. But if you say there are no limits on how good you can be, you can be special. You can be different. Somebody has to be the standout. Why not you? And this is the last one before I turn it to you, Dove. Amanda Watson is asking, what are your hopes for Team Israel in the future? Uh, I have two hopes. I have uh, one, I hope they continue to 
play in the tournament and win some games and, and stay in the tournament to a point where they don't have to requalify and the game of Israel can grow around it. And I hope that eventually we have kids that grew up in Israel, naturalized citizens that end up being the stars on that team. And we eventually see our first native born Israeli make it to the major leagues. Um, and I think it would be really, really cool is if somebody got to watch us play in the, in the WBC and it inspired them to be great. So what the, the Denver Nuggets will we'll switch to basketball for a second. Novak Djokovic said that he watched the, the dream team in the Olympics and it inspired him to play basketball. And now he's a two-time MVP of the league and, and the, the Denver Nuggets are built around him. I think that would be so cool if somebody in Israel watched us play and goes on to be a superstar in their own right. And we can talk about them someday. That would be one of my, my, the coolest things that I, I could experience. You know, Ryan, that's a really interesting segue to sort of a penultimate question that I have. You know, you talk about the, the small numbers, the mighty numbers of Jews in, in Major League Baseball today. Is there an association between the Jewish ballplayers in the Major Leagues and other professional sports? Is there anything that, like, is, is there ever any reason for, maybe maybe it's based on a city that you live in, or it's uh, uh, sort of an overall, I know like there's the Jewish Coaches Association, something like that. Is there anything like the Jewish Professional Ball Players Association that gets you together to encourage, perhaps to be able to encourage others like you to play for the Israeli teams and other sports that they're uh, professionals in? Uh, not that I've experienced yet, but that might be a cool idea to start. I'd be up for it if you want to talk off off of this broadcast. I can't. Uh, I'll, it's my new side project at work. Uh, Ted, thank you for the approval. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I guess my final question for you, Ryan, is, you know, we, we're talking, we're here today, Yom Hatzmut, Israel's 75th birthday. Um, what type of closing message do you have uh, about the importance of Israel you already talked about the safe haven for the Jewish people, but sort of the future of American Jewry. Any any parting words of wisdom that you'd like to share? My my biggest thing is is participate and be proud. Um, I I think that that Jewish people and, and Black people have so much in common, except for that when a Black person walks into a room, it's obvious, and, and any anyone else in the room can tell, and they can support each other. And they can really build community and then ask questions later. And I think as Jews, it's, it's less obvious. So we need, to, we need to participate and we need to be proud. And you need to be, be public because the only way that we can get the benefit of the community and strength in numbers is if we support each other and we're aware of who each other are. I've received so much benefit in my life from embracing the community and stepping out into the public. And it's, it's really changed my life and it's changed how I view myself as a man. And, and it's changed the direction that I want to raise my family. And it, it's been such a positive chain and I've changed and I've had such a positive um, embrace from the community. And I, and I want others to experience that. And I never would have experienced it if I didn't go out of my way to participate in Team Israel. So I encourage anybody watching, go out, get involved, anything in your community, a team you can get involved in. Um, it's been so positive for me and I hope it can be so positive for you as well. Well, Ryan, on, be, on behalf of the American Jewish Committee, uh, thank you very much for, for joining us for this wonderful conversation with you today. I, I hope to see you in Atlanta or maybe Denver or Los Angeles or somewhere in the world that our paths will cross. Uh, and I'd like to throw it to Claire to uh, close us out from today's program. Thank you, Ryan. And thank you, Doe, for today's inspiring conversation. And thank you to our global audience for tuning in. Be sure to check out this episode and more at ajc.org slash people of the pod or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can continue celebrating Israel 75 and join AJC in Tel Aviv June 11th through 14th for this year's AJC Global Forum. You can learn more and register at ajc.org slash global forum. Thank you again and goodbye.